Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Uh, a 50 year old female presented to ER with history of fall on left knee from bike. On initial 10 second assessment, airway patent no secretions, C spine was uh, maintained no ten non tender, neck movements were normal, breathing, uh, respiratory rate was 17 per minute, saturation 100% on room air, chest movements bilaterally equal, air entry bilaterally equal. Coming to circulation, heart rate was 96 per minute, BP 130 by 90 millimeters of mercury, all peripheral pulsations equally felt. Coming to disability, GCS was 15 by 15 and pupils bilaterally equal and reacting. Exposure, febrile. Okay. Uh, coming to secondary survey, uh, 50 year old female presented to ER with history of fall on left knee from bike and now complaining of pain and swelling over the left knee. Following the incident, she had swelling and difficulty in bearing weight. No history of any head injury, loss of consciousness, vomiting, seizures, any breathing difficulty, abdominal pain. Okay. Uh, past history is a dyslipidemia, is having on atorvastatin. Uh, on um, coming to examination. Any external wounds is visible or? No, only no, swelling. Only onwards. swelling is there. Okay. Uh, coming to head, no visible injuries, no uh, injuries or no active bleeding, C spine and neck. Local no examination, you can see. Local examination on left knee, inspection, there are no external injuries, there is significant swelling of the left knee, no erythema, no sinus bleeding or discharge. On palpation, local warmth was there, uh, tenderness noted over patella and joint line tenderness was also there. Uh, since she was having severe pain, we didn't do other uh, ligament tests. Okay. Uh, movements, uh, total range of, uh, range of movements were severely restricted. Uh, neurovascular examination, sensations were intact, distal pulse were palpable. So, uh, a patient has come with a distal, uh, proximal tibial injury, injury. Right? around the knee joint. Around the knee joint. Okay. You uh, went ahead with the local examination. There is some swelling. Okay. So, uh, probably what could be the reason for that swelling? Uh, uh, either if you um, uh, hematoma. Uh, it's a, most commonly it is a hematoma. Uh, there is a fracture with hematoma or an isolated hematoma. Okay. That is the most common reason. Then following a trauma, I am saying. Okay. I am not saying okay. a generalized reason for a uh, knee swelling. The next thing you started evaluating her, observing the uh, first thing what you have to see, how the limp is, attitude of the limp, how she is keeping, whether it's she is uh, keeping in full flexion or full extension. Full extension. Full extension, that's what she is keeping. Uh, uh, any uh, uh, open skin intact or not, you said skin the skin is intact. intact, that is very important because there is an underlying fracture, if there is any abrasion or there is any deep penetrating injury, that will be an open fracture. Okay. Then the next thing what you have suggested is the uh, examination, the range of movements. Uh, in a trauma case, it is very difficult to examine in the range of movements. It will be painful and special tests like all the meniscal injuries and all those tests is not being done because of the pain, pain. and because of the problem risk involved. Uh, what you have given for the pain management here? Pain initially we gave paracetamol. Mm. The uh, pain score was 8 by 10 severe pain. Uh, then it reduced to... Um, so, always it's better to give some opioid in the mm -hmm. top end. You give some opioid along with paracetamol or some NSAID. That will be an ideal situation. Mm -hmm. So, don't just give paracetamol, won't be sufficient mm -hmm. enough. So, you will be doing some manipulation. So, every time the patient will have significant pain. And the most important thing, what do you need to do? You need to splint that limb. Mm -hmm. That is the first thing that you should do. You should be splinting that limb. Uh, just simple immobilization. That is the first thing that we should be doing mm -hmm. before all those things. Once you see there is an involvement of injury, you should splint the splint, uh, you should splint the joint and uh, you said regarding the neurovascular structures. So what are neurovascular structures that you are anticipating to get involved in a knee joint injury? Uh, tibial nerve. Okay. And, uh, so tibial nerve you wanted to, you, any nerve you need to do two tests. One is motor and one is sensory. So you said regarding tibial nerve. So what are the action, motor action of tibial nerve that you want to look in? Um, dorsiflexion. Okay. And uh, eversion. In, it's inversion or eversion? Uh, inversion. Inversion. Okay. Then? Plantar flexion also can be checked. Okay. Then? The other group of nerve. Okay. Sensation, how will you check? Sensations are mainly over the uh, this, um, web space. Between the first and second toe. So that is the isolated area which is supplied by the tibial nerve. The next group of nerve, next nerve, um, common peroneal nerve is what you need to evaluate. Common uh, peroneal nerve, what all things you want to look in for? Uh, you will have foot drop. Uh, so you want to change the action of tibial nerve now? It's mostly 
Planned or flexion. Planned or flexion and inversion. Mm. And uh, common perioral nerve, when it is injured, what will you have? You will have foot drop. Foot. So, what does it do? It does the dorsiflexion. Dorsi okay. Then, uh, where else you will look for the uh, sensation? Except, or except this, the, the first, first web space. space, all the other area you can look for the sensation. So, these are the two nerves that you need to check in for. Then comes the next is the vascular structures. Mm. What are the uh, blood vessels that possibly can get injured? Um, anterior tibial artery. Okay. Uh, popliteal. You can come from the top. Uh, popliteal, anterior tibial and posterior tibial. So, these are the two blood groups. And you just look for the distal pulsation, dorsalis pedis and all those things. That is enough. Okay. So, why you wanted to check these things? Because uh, proximal tibial fracture is the most common cause of this anterior compartment, cause anterior, means acute compartment syndrome. So, what is so specific regarding the leg um, a very small space there is got we have got four compartments okay. so that is the most important thing very four compartments and it is very thickly densely arranged in a way so what are the compartments of the uh, leg anterior anterior lateral lateral and deep posterior deep posterior superficial, superficial. so these are the four compartments which are very prone to develop the common or uh, complication called as compartment syndrome so that is the reason why the tibial fractures everything is very common and uh, whenever you have a tibial fracture or uh, you have a knee joint injury or whatever be it is injury and proximal knee joint injury, this compartment syndrome is a big, big challenge. And uh, the most important thing, the classical area where the fibular nerve can get involved, uh, sorry, the common pedal nerve can get involved is Shaft. the neck of fibula. That is where it winds around. winds around. So that is a common area. So when you have a proximal fibular fracture, you can have common parietal nerve injury and a foot drop. So uh, when you are seeing a foot drop, you are very sure that there is a common parietal nerve injury. Somewhere the common parietal nerve, most common area it is in the neck of the fibula. Neck of the fibula is the fracture is the most common thing. So as an emergency physician, our job is to initially to splint. That is a very important thing. We have to splint. Whatever be the method, you have to splint it and we are going to restrict the motion and pain management and we need to look in for x-ray images. Mm. What all images you want? Uh, this knee joint. Mm. So now the question arises whether she was, you said that she was bent the knee and she has hit the floor. That is the mechanism of injury. So what all fractures that you will suspect in this patient? Possible injuries. Patella. Patella fracture, okay. Uh, distal femur. Distal femur. Proximal tibia. Proximal tibia. Fibula. Fibula. Proximal fibular fracture also we can suspect and very very rarely you can have a hip fracture. Very rarely because the impact, very rarely dislocation or fracture you can have but it's very rare. It is not like fall on an outstretched hand where you will have commonly have a shoulder injury is also possibility. Similarly, you might need to think about that also. And now what all x-ray views that you have asked for her in the uh, ED? X-ray means knee, AP lateral. AP lateral and? Oblique views, epilateral and oblique views. That's what routinely we need, and very rarely, sometimes you want to look for the plateaus, and oh, you need to ask for a plateau view also. That is the additional view, but not very commonly. But AP oblique and lateral views is required. And the most problematic thing is that we can easily miss an undisplaced tibial fracture. We can easily miss. I mean, tibial plateaus are the different plateaus. Everything is there. You will have can easily miss. So whenever you have a suspicion like this, that patient might need a CT to confirm the fracture because the fracture might happen and there is no dislocation. So the patient is having significant pain mm -hmm. and you feel there is tenderness. You have doubt in mind. It is always advisable to take a CT. We can easily miss. So, what was the uh, findings for her? Uh, X-ray, uh, left knee showing a proximal tibial fracture mm. with a plateau and CT. Where was the have... fracture? Medial, lateral? Uh, medial. Medial, medial. okay. And they, uh, we, we did, we given as ortho consultation. So, they took a CT peripheral angiography, which showed a comminuted displaced fracture of left medial tibial plateau, Schatzker 4 type and hematoma along the left knee joint and there are no there are no vascular injury. Okay. And they also taken an MRI for ligament injuries. So it, it was also showing a tibial plateau fracture with subchondral edema, uh, moderate joint effusion, complete tear of anterior cruciate ligament, avulsion fracture of tibial attachment of posterior cruciate ligament. Okay. Uh, both medial and lateral meniscus displaced with complex tears and uh, tear of uh, medial uh, cruciate ligament also. Okay. So ACL, MCL? Everything. If this patient is not having a fracture, sports injury, how will you assess for this joint? 
all this ligament anterior crochet ligament we can do anterior drawers anterior drawers laxmentus posterior drawers for the posterior, posterior. then then uh, menisci menisci uh, um, Uh, this crush uh, that is the macmurestus that you want to do then collaterals varus and valgus then you can look for a collateral ligament medial varus and lateral varus Valcus. you can look for the deformity this one one test name test which ever test you want to remember you can remember well and good but uh, this patient we can't do uh, it's not needed it's not advisable to do also but mri again uh, this was suggested to look for the mening uh, meningeal injury meniscal injuries and the collateral uh, ligaments injuries but what our aim is to primarily to get a proper x ray immobilize the limb and what are the possible complications of this fracture you said regarding compartment syndrome what are the other potential complications joint defusion they went ahead with a ct peripheral angiogram what is the reason Neuro behind that vascular injuries there can be a direct vascular injury rather than a compartment injury there can be a direct okay. vascular injury so that's another problem that long bone fractures what are the complication of long bone fractures oh, okay. were they admitted the patient in ICU. in the icu why they admitted in the icu fat embolism fat embolism initial first 48 hours there are high prone to develop a fat embolism so sudden deterioration you need to suspect so when will you suspect fat embolism in this patient acute onset breathlessness mm. desaturation confusion acute confusion desaturation Technical. so these are the all the time we need to suspect if fat, fat embolism treatment mm -hmm. treatment as is there is no there nothing much of a treatment but you can prevent it mm. the problem here is as arises here is whether to give dvt prophylaxis or not mm. already there is a hematoma and whether you want to give heparin or not are they, have they given heparin no they haven't given they haven't given heparin no. when did they took for surgery um, it was late actually she was admitted initially she, she was done a knee spanning and external fixator application was given mm. and then posted for left knee meniscal repair and tibial plateau open reduction they will definitely would have started her on plexane and they would have stopped plexane maybe 24 hours before the surgery so definitely she requires a dvt prophylaxis that in terms of a drug it is not like you are giving mechanical compression devices and all it will not work here so you have to give plexane for this patient low molecular weight apparel 0.4 to 0.6 0.6 is the idea od dose has to be started maybe initial 24 hours we can wait maybe active bleeding everything is there maybe wait but if you are planning not planning for an early surgery why they are not planning for an early surgery to reduce the efficiency to reduce the edema. edema so uh, there can be a lot of edema surrounding the fracture mm -hmm. so this time they might if there is no edema and all they can straight away take for the surgery mm -hmm. so if there is an edema active edema and all maybe they will wait for another 48 to 72 hours to edema to settle then they will go ahead and with the surgery so that's a usual protocol now uh, the question arises here is whether uh, it's an open fracture mm -hmm. what additional things you wanted to do in here antibiotic prophylaxis so antibiotic prophylaxis yes and tetanus prophylaxis okay. these are the two options that we need to think of what antibiotic prophylaxis you need to start in uh, what antibiotic you want to start uh, gram negative anti anaerobic coverage gram negative gram positive anaerobic all the coverage you okay. can give any cephalosporin and uh, maybe metronidazole depending upon uh, whether it is very contaminated wound and all definitely you need to give metronidazole also and tetanus prophylaxis yes Uh, depending upon again very much contaminated if the patient is not uh, tetanus uh, vaccination he has not taken then you need to give tetanus immunoglobulin also but these days there is shortage of availability of tetanus immunoglobulin but uh, you need to remember you need to give antibiotics and the same day within the same day they need to take it for debridement also otherwise what will happen the joint will get get infected so that is one thing when you have an open fracture when you have a closed fracture like this the problem complications are different like a compartment syndrome neurovascular injuries and all so when will you suspect a compartment syndrome for this patient when the pain is out of proportion what is the first sign that you can have pain or passive stretch pain just stretch pain you can just stretch the limb and the patient is complaining of pain, pain. the classical paresthesis paresthesia and all it's already the patient has gone into compartment syndrome so that you won't uh, you don't want that to happen so by the time the patient is complaining of stretch pain you need to think in terms of uh, compartment syndrome and what you need to do then fasciotomy you need to do an immediate fasciotomy the pressure monitoring devices technically it's not available these days so maybe the simple thing what you can do to measure the girth that's the only thing you can just measure the girth and if it is increasing by 1 cm and the symptom is also increasing you can think that this patient is going for a possible compartment syndrome and only thing it's a clinical diagnosis 
it's now imaging nothing the pressure monitoring devices and all they will tell but it's not available more than 35 mm as you think of this thing that is all not available but it's a clinical suspicion whenever you have a stretch pain you think the patient has gone into compartment syndrome and immediately fasciotomy has to be done because of the anatomical composition of that area because of how that is structured in that area you need to do because anterior compartment posterior compartment you have superficial and deep compartments and lateral compartment not posterior lateral compartment anterior and lateral which is more common to develop compartment anterior. syndrome anterior. anterior compartment is more uh, prone to develop the compartment syndrome okay you have anything else the classification you want to add on add on because classification of fracture i can't remember i am i can't remember i am not joking there are a lot of classification i am unable to remember those things it is of no use for an emergency physician to understand all those things but our aim is to basically we need to recognize what are the potential complications what x-ray we need to take what are the major uh, structures that we need to think of what are the probable structures that can get injured as you said starting from the patella you need to think of the femoral uh, the distal femur you need to think of the proximal tibia the meniscal injuries the blood vessel the neurovascular structures what is getting involved in and around what are the how will you understand how will you assess the sensation tibial sensation tibial nerve sensation tibial function motor function that is what we need to know at this point of time and most important thing splinting which i think you have missed in your presentation that's the only first thing what we need to do for any fracture immobilize so that's the immobilize and apply an ice pack that is the only thing that we can do for it is actually a non pharmacological treatment for pain reduction you have pharmacological methods this is a non pharmacological method splinting and ice ice packs over the wood okay you have anything else you add on classification and all anyone can read mm. theoretically i don't i can't remember so i don't think that you should be remembering those things fine thank you thank you sir.